you hear me? Can you raise it up? Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 through 5. Uncle Steve, it's always good to be here with you. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Cousin Josh, I appreciate the music every time. I, and I know I say that every time, but I, you guys are blessed to have good music. I've been in churches that <laughs> do not have a good music ministry, and it really affects the service. And I, I appreciate everything that Brother Josh and everyone that helps him do every week. And uh, I love the announcements here. I'm, I've never been in a church where I enjoy the announcements as much as I enjoy the announcements here. And uh, this is a unique place. It's hard to believe it's been nearly a year that you've been in this building, and God has blessed you with this. I remember uh, when this all took place and what an answer to prayer it was uh, for this. Today is a special day, Mother's Day. Uh, when I pastored full time, I, I enjoyed days like today. Uh, and I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to preach on a special day like Mother's Day. Um, there's just so many things that could be said or, uh, and should be said on Mother's Day. But also you want to honor and glorify God at the same time. And you want to honor the mothers as well. The Bible says honor to whom honor is due. And uh, mothers definitely deserve honor. Amen. And so we're going to take a little bit of time today and honor some mothers. And I realize today that uh, Mother's Day can be a bittersweet day. And it could be a wonderful day. And, and sometimes it's both for some of you here today. Um, there's, there's the regular moms and have their children and they're doing well. And boy, they're just happy. And, and sometimes maybe today that they're with you or you'll get to see them at some point. And it's a wonderful time for you. And there's others that are, you know, you're your stepmom and you stepped up to the plate and you did a job. If it wasn't for my stepdad, I wouldn't really have had a dad uh, in my life on a daily basis. And I'm thankful for that. So stepmoms have a big responsibility and in no way diminished to a, to a regular mother, obviously. And in some ways, the job that you've taken on may be more difficult. And then you think of the moms who, uh, or the ladies that can't have children. And, and this is a tough day for you because you've tried and, and you wonder why or, and, uh, and you question. But you know what? Some of the dearest ladies that I've known in my life didn't have children, but they stepped up in the church as a spiritual mother and, and they, they found some young lady and they just invested in them or a young man and invested in them. And so don't look at today as a bad day. Look as an opportunity uh, to, to find somebody that you can just make your spiritual child or your adopted child even. And I think of today, there are several ladies that I know in my life that have lost a child already. And that's a, that's a horrible thing for a mother or a father to lose a child. It's an unnatural thing. Um, I, I believe the natural order is for the parents to go and then the children and then the, the grandchildren and so on. And if you've lost a child, today can be a tough day for you. And a heart goes out to you uh, in that matter. I was reading a, a little thing on Facebook this morning, a friend of mine that I grew up in high school with, and, and she put a post on there about how she's tried to have children and cannot, and how today is a tough day for her, and, and a heart goes out for her and others like that. So regardless of your circumstance, if you're a lady here today, we want to honor you in some way, shape, or form, and want you to know you're important, and you're important to God. Amen. Exodus chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4. Let's start there. The Bible says... And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, uh, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer uh, hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And we'll touch on that story in just a little while. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach the others, or shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a, so, a good soldier. And um, I'm sorry, I read a few wrong verses. A couple of verses are very good, though. Look in verse 5 of chapter 1. And this is one I, we're going to touch on this morning. It says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first, first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that in thee also. Obviously talking about Timothy. Now go back to Genesis chapter 3 
to the first mother in the Bible. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Before we pray, I want to read a couple things that I saw this week on the internet and I thought were um, somewhat humorous and somewhat serious. You know you're a mother when. You know you're a mother when. Instead of running from projectile vomit, you run towards it. You know you're a mother when you do more in seven minutes than most people do all day long. You know you're a mother when happy hour is the 60 minutes between your kids going to bed and you going to bed. You know you're a mother when many therapy sessions all day long are with anyone who will listen to you. You know you're a mother when going to the grocery store by yourself is a vacation. You know you're a mother when you think of physical pain on three levels. Pain, excruciating pain, and the pain of stepping on a Lego. You would rather, I like this one, it's a little serious. You'd rather have a 103 degree fever than to watch one of your children suffer with it. You know you're a mother when a 15 minute shower with a door locked feels like a day at the spa. You know you're a mother when you have a secret chocolate stash because frankly you're sick and tired of sharing it. You know you're a mother when you've been washing the same load of laundry for three days because you forgot to dry it. And then last, I think this one's kind of humorous. By the end of the day, that brushing your teeth feels like a huge accomplishment. Isn't that something? At the end of the day, just to be able to brush your teeth, thank you, Jesus, right? Listen, I appreciate moms. Now, we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. And the Bible says that Adam called his wife's name Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living When I think of Eve, I think of her on this day specifically because she was the first mother in the Bible. She was the first woman uh, to give birth to a child. And the things that I thought about when I thought about Eve were, were some of these things. Did she know what to expect in having a child? You know, the books out there now for you young ladies, what to expect when you're expecting and things like that. Eve could not go to Barnes & Noble and buy that book. Uh, Eve, I thought about her. I wonder if she was afraid of being a mother. I wonder if she knew how important motherhood was. Of all of her kids, we only know of Cain, Abel, and Seth by name. We know about Eve as she was the first mother to lose a child, Abel. And she was also, she also lost her other son, Cain, because he was banished from her because of the evil that he had committed. So in some ways, she lost her first two children. And when you think about all this, but it was through Seth, which was her third son, that people began to call in the name of the Lord. So in some ways, I imagine she felt like a a failure to Abel because she couldn't protect him. And she failed Cain in some way because he did the evil that he did. But Seth brought her, I believe, a lot of joy and a lot of pleasure because of him, people began to call in the name of the Lord. When I think of mothers, mothers are amazing people. They bring us into the world, they nurture us, they provide for us, they raise us, they teach us, they discipline us, and mothers can help change the world through their children. So this morning, regardless of who you are, whether you're a child or whether you're a a husband or whether you're a mother or a lady here today, I want you to listen to what the Bible has to say about mothers today. Hopefully it will help you, and if nothing else, it will give you a greater appreciation of your mother and other ladies in your life. So we're going to look at several different ladies this morning. The first lady I'd like to look at, go back to Exodus chapter 2 and verse number 1 through 4. And we have the story again of Moses' mother. Exodus chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. Now we know the story here about Jochebed, that she had this child and uh, she wasn't supposed to have this child. And if it was a boy, it was going to be killed. Well, when she saw the child born, the child was a good son. And, and what mother doesn't look at their child and think to themselves, this child is perfect in every way, shape, or form? Now, as a pastor, I saw a lot of children, and a lot of children are not very good looking, okay? But every mother thinks that their child is the best looking child that has ever walked the face of the earth or crawled the face of the earth. You know what I'm saying here, right? But the thing that I think about Jochebed, when he was born, I imagine her heart sunk because it was a son. If it would have been a daughter, she could have kept the daughter no problem. But because it was a son, the soldiers were going to come and take her her son away from her and kill her son. But look at the effort she went through to save Moses. 
She hid him for three months, and when he could no longer be hid, she put him in a little ark and set him into the river and watched over him, knowing, I believe knowing, Uncle Steve, that Pharaoh's daughter bathed down at that river, knowing that if he would send, it down, send the baby down at the right time, that maybe one of those servants or maybe Pharaoh's daughter would pick up her son and save her son from certain death. When I think of Jochebed in the Bible, this is what I think of. I think of a protective mother. Now, what mother is not a protective mother? Or at least what natural mother is not a protective mother? But you look in the animal kingdom and you look at how uh, mothers of their cubs and of their children, if you will, the offspring, to what great lengths that they will go to to protect their children or to protect their young. Jochebed is, I believe, a great example of a mother who is a protective mother. Now, what did she do, and how did she protect her son? I believe the first thing she did is that she trusted God to protect Moses. I mean, how much faith do you think it had to take? How much trust in God would it have to take to let him go in the Nile, the Nile being infested with these crocodiles and and all these other dangerous things, to let that baby go in praying and trusting God that somehow God would do a miracle, that somehow God would do the right thing. And you know, I think of mothers, boy, uh, 9 o'clock comes around and your child is supposed to be home and 9.01 comes. I mean, what worry goes through your mind? I mean, what things race through your heart when you think to yourself, is my child okay? Why? Because a mother is a protective mother. See, moms put us, uh, they protect us physically. They keep us from danger. How many of you had a mother that told you to stop running through the house with your pair of scissors? My mom did probably a thousand times, Okay. Dean, stop running with scissors in your hand, right? Dean, watch what you're doing. Why? Because it's a mother's job to do those things. Mothers keep us from danger. They try to protect us from danger. You know, it's dad says, go out there and break a leg, you know, and it's mom's like, no, don't go break a leg, you know. I remember one day I was jumping off the roof as my mother was coming around the corner. It was a bad day for me. I'm going to tell you that right now. God bless you, Mom, if you see this. And uh, I remember one day uh, my mom came home from work, and I was on top of the roof. And we lived on a big old home on Pine Street in Washington, Illinois, and it was three stories to the top and then some. And it was a very steep roof, but I learned that if I went to the valley, I could do one foot, one foot, one foot up each side, and I'd get to the top, and I could see the world from my house. Mom came around the corner a little quicker than she usually did and saw me scurrying down the valley back into the house. Well, that was another bad day for Dean Jones. Why? Because my mom was trying to protect me physically. There's a reason mom didn't let me wander too far from home, because of the dangers out there. See, mothers protect us physically. Mothers also protect us morally by teaching us right from wrong. You know, uh, my mom was always here, and she always knew when I was up to no good. I think it's the intuition that God gives a mom. You know what I'm saying? I believe it is tied directly to the Holy Ghost, right? But my mom has that. And uh, my mom would look at me and know, you're up to no good. I didn't even do it yet. I was just thinking about it, you know? (laughs) But that's what moms do. Moms protect us morally. They can look at their children and they know something's not right. And it's that, I believe, that intuition that God puts in their heart to protect their children morally. See, good moms are more concerned with being a mom more than being a good friend. I'll tell you today, my mom was one of my best friends. But my mom was more concerned about raising me and teaching me and sometimes being unpopular with me than she was with being my best buddy or being my best friend. And I'm going to tell you, there were days where my mom was my best friend and my mom was my best pal and my mom was my best cheerleader and 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 my best person that I could confide in. But when it came time to being a mom, my mom knew the difference. And listen, I encourage you mothers, know the difference between being a mother and being a friend. There's times where you got to do the hard thing. There's times where you got to just, you know what, uh, just lay it down and be the mom and teach them. Proverbs chapter 23, 23 through 25, talk about the influence that a father and a mother have on their children. And it's more important than just being their buddy. See, because good moms know how to be a mom when it's tough. Not only this, but moms also, not only do they protect us physically and they protect us morally, but I believe they also protect us emotionally. Moms try to teach us lessons before we have to live them ourselves. 
My mom's a great lady, a godly lady, married to my, my father. They, they pastor a church up in Kewanee, Illinois, and, and I admire them greatly. But my mom made some horrible mistakes as a teenager. You know what my mom tried to do to my sister and myself? Is say, don't make the same mistakes that I made. My mom says, Dean, don't, don't go hang out with that crowd because this is where it's going to take you. And how many moms tried to warn their children and say, don't do this because it's going to hurt you bad if you do. Amen. And unfortunately, many people say, i got to learn it for myself. But what was mom trying to do? Save them from the pain that she had to go through. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. My mom taught me some valuable lessons in life. Like not to think about myself higher than I ought to think about myself. My mom taught me lessons like how to be a good loser. Now, she was bad at teaching me this, but she tried, okay? Um, how to be a good loser, how to take it. Listen, you're not going to win everything in life. She taught me things like you can't please everybody. So you better decide who's the most important people in your life to please and please them. i tell you what, moms, I believe, have this ability to protect us emotionally, physically, and morally. Mom taught me this great lesson, to think before I speak. Because if I put on Facebook everything I was thinking when I first thought it, I'd be apologizing a whole bunch. My mom taught me to think before I speak because if I told you what I was really thinking when you're running me down to my face, I'd be in big trouble. And honestly, I don't like to apologize, so if I can avoid it by not saying something really dumb, then I'm well ahead of the game, right? Listen, I think you should apologize when you do wrong. I think you should admit when you do wrong. I think you ought to own it. But if you can learn to think before you speak, then you don't have to do it as often, okay? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 uh, 6 through 8, let me just share with you that passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It says, Nor of man sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. He says, this is how we ought to deal with people, like a mom deals with her child. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also of our own souls because you were dear unto us. You know what what Paul was saying here? He was saying, hey, I wanted to give you not just the gospel, but I wanted to give you all the important things that I had learned and all the lessons that I had been taught and all the things that God had showed me. You know what he was saying? He was likening it to a mother. A mother, she wants to teach us. Not only does a mother want to bring you to God, but she wants to teach you all the valuable, important things in life. Why? Because she knows it's important to you. Listen, the first mother that we look at this morning, Jochebed, Moses' mother, a protective mother. And if you're a mom, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The second kind of mother I'd like to look at this morning is the supportive mother. In 1 Samuel chapter number uh, 1, In verse 24, we read the story here of Hannah. And it says, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with her three bullocks, and one ephah of flour, and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah, a barren woman who desperately wanted a child, made a deal with God that, God, if you give me a child, I will give the child back to you. And I tell you what, isn't that an amazing thing for a mother to have the attitude, God, you have lent me a child. You have given me a child. The least that I can do for you, God, is to give the child back to you. And listen, and it took a lot. And when I, when I think of Hannah and I think of the supportive mother, she helped Samuel to want to be in the will of God with his life. And I'm telling you, the influence that a mother has in their child's heart is incredible and it's amazing. And I'm telling you what, there's a lot of influences out there. There's a lot of people out there trying to steal your children and trying to steal their hearts. But I tell you what, there's something about a mother who will support their child to do the right thing. She was a mother who was willing to give her child over to the Lord. And that is not easy, is it, moms? Say, God, here's my kid. Do with them whatever you would have to do with them. Very tough. 
This mother desires for her children to be what the Lord wants them to be. And see, I think about this. It's a very difficult thing, like I mentioned, to let God have your child. Because what God might do with your child is take your child away from you and move them across the country. And God forbid he might take your child and put them in a foreign country to, to, to minister to some people who have never heard the gospel before. And that's your child and, and your investment. But a wise mother, I think, believes this, and a wise father would do the same thing, knowing that their child is safest in the center of God's will. Amen. You know, Evan and Madison and Mackenzie, if God wants them over in Afghanistan today, giving the gospel out, they will be safer in Afghanistan than they will in Decatur, Illinois, right. next to me, or even living in my own home. True, because the center of God's will, I believe, is the safest place for our children. But are we... Like Hannah, are we willing to say, God, here's my child. Do with them whatever you would have to do with them. See, the truth is, as parents, we are entrusted with our children. She uses the phrase here that she lent her child to the Lord. I think the reverse is true. God lent the child to her for her to give back to God. And when I think of my children, I'm not thinking that I'm doing God a favor by saying, here, do with them what you want. I feel like God gave me a favor by letting me have my children. Amen. And it's my job to teach them and to, and to grow them up and to nurture and the admonition of the Lord and then to show them that, hey, God's will for their life is the greatest will that they could ever do and that if they would follow him, that that would be the best thing. And in some ways, I look at my children, and they're 9, 10, and 11 years old now. They're halfway gone. And it's sad sometimes, Uncle Steve, to think of how they're almost grown and all they're almost gone. And, and what might God do with them? Yeah. Or where might he take them? Glory. I love my parents to death. Hallelujah. I graduated from Bible college and he stuck me down in the Gulf of Mexico. I lived in Peoria my whole life. I was on the Bayou Tesh, which is next to the Intercoastal Waterway, in the middle of Cajun land. <laughs> 900 some miles away from my family. Don't you think that was tough on my mom? It was tough on me, but I'll tell you this, it probably was tougher on my mom than it was on me. Listen, a wise parent is like Hannah. Says, God, you gave me this child. I will give the child back to you. And God bless you mothers who are willing to understand and trust God enough that what he has for your children is better than what you could ever dream or expect or have for them yourself. The third type of mother here this morning in the Bible that I'd like to look at is this lady called Eunice. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And for context, let's just go ahead and read from verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God who I have served for my forefathers, with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. What does that unfeigned faith mean? It's unshakable. It's unshakable faith. Where did Timothy get this unshakable faith put in him? It was from his mother and his grandmother. That's where it came from. Here we go. And it says, Faith that is in thee which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Amen. See, you know, when I think of Eunice and I think of uh, the grandmother also, very influential here, uh, Lois, um, how the, the Bible literally shows us a picture of them, how they were the instructive type of a mother. Yeah. I tell you what, it's a job of a mother to teach the children. It's, it's very, very important. I know the father needs to teach him as well. But moms, you have the ability. You have more time at times to, to instruct them and show them things. And frankly, it just seems sometimes that moms are more patient than dads are. And it's, they're easier to be entreated. See, this was the mother of Timothy. Timothy's grandmother and mom instilled in him the faith that they already had. Right? It wasn't like they were trying to say, hey, Timothy, you need to do as I say and not as I do. You know what I'm saying? Because how effective has that been in our life? 
uh, when a dad is drinking a beer and he looks at his son, he says, son, you should never drink. How effective is that? When a mother or father says, kids, you shouldn't smoke, it'll kill you. How effective is that? But when a dad doesn't drink and says, son, you shouldn't drink and here's why. And, and when a mom and a dad don't smoke and they say, don't do it because here's why. And when a, a grandmother and a mother say, uh, Timothy, you ought to trust God with your life. And, and here's why, because I trusted him here and, and here's how he took care of me. And, and I did this and, and I was sick and he met my need here or whatever the testimonies might be. They had their own that they shared with Timothy that helped form a concrete faith. In his life. Listen, you can't instruct your kids if you don't have it yourself. You got to have it yourself, moms. You got to have it yourself, dads. If anyone can reach your children, it's going to be mom. Mom has a way of getting a hold of a kid's heart. In a way, sometimes, that even a dad might not be able to. My dad could be stern and rough with me. And, and I could know he was right, but inside have a hard heart toward him. But you know how hard it was to have a hard heart toward my mother? Even when she irritated me. Even when mom would say, son, you got an attitude problem. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. You got an I do now. Thank you, mom. How many of you had a mom say, look at me when I'm talking to you, and then said, don't look at me that way? That was my mom. Listen. If anyone, though, can reach their children, it's mom. See, mom should be the first ones, I think, for them to hear about God from. Moms and dads together, but I think mom ought to tell their children why she's even nursing them and rocking them about how much Jesus loves them, how much God loves them, how important that is. I think that uh, the first songs that they hear ought to be about Jesus. I think the kid ought to hear Jesus loves me before he hears ABCs or Rockabye Baby or all these other songs. And I'm not against these other songs, don't get me wrong. But I think songs about God ought to be the first songs that they hear. And they ought to hear them from their mom, I think. Before anything happens in their life, it ought to be a godly influence for mom. I saw a little baby's here today. Uh, Hayden's here today. It's great that he's in church. He don't even know what's going on, but he's in church. And if they keep him in church, he's going to grow up thinking he's been in church from day one and just about. A young lady here had a little baby. I can tell she's glowing carrying her little baby around. What an awesome thing to have a child in church at that young of an age. To where maybe they look back at their life and just, they've been in church their whole life. That's all they remember is being in church. I think that's important. And it's more important at times than you think it might be. Talk to them about the lessons they learned. You guys dismissed for a, a children's church thing. Moms, talk to your kids when you get in the car. What would you learn today? What would you learn about God? You'd be amazed the stories that kids would tell you about the Bible stories they heard. Because in their mind, they have these imaginations, right? And the story of Moses and the Red Sea can really get elaborate, I'm telling you. The prodigal son story can really get awesome coming from a kid because they just filled in the pieces that they think happened. I mean, cor Corvettes and cheeseburgers and things come into Bible stories. It's amazing. I remember my son was telling me that God called in a nuclear strike on, on Egypt and Pharaoh. and his, I'm like, where did you get that from? Listen, moms and grandmas have a tremendous influence. My question to you, my challenge to you is, what are you teaching them? Because you have an opportunity. You have an open door that other people don't have. And I'll, I'll tell you this. If your kids go to the public school, and my kids do, if you don't teach them before they go, and you don't teach them while they're there, I'm telling you this, they will brainwash your kids into believing what they want. If you don't do it, who will, mom? Number four, there's another mother, and I think it's the loyal mother. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse number 16. And I know you know this story, but I want you to hear it again. The Bible says, Then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him 
on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest to the Jews, to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what have I written? I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments, they made four parts. To every soldier a part and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. And they said therefore unto themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. And the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them. And for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. The loyal mother is Mary. And I realize all these other mothers could have been all of these things in one, and you may be as well. And I hope you are, because I think that's the complete package of a mother. But Mary, there's evidence, a story of a loyal mother. I I don't think it was a popular decision for her to be standing there that day. Probably a very dangerous decision to be standing there that day. Because surely the crowd could have took her and blamed her and stoned her or crucified her as well. But she's the loyal mother. Can you even begin to imagine, though, go there in your mind. Can you even begin to imagine the pain? that she is experiencing at this moment in her life. How many of you have had a child that fell down and scraped their knee or broke a bone or needed stitches? My daughter, good night, we were at a a friend of mine, Jamie, and I, we coached soccer, and we've been coaching these kids since they're four years old, and now they're 11, and and we were at his house waiting for a a tournament uh, to come. My daughter was videoing my son and his friend playing Uh, basketball in the house. She was holding an iPad like this. They threw the ball at her. It hit the iPad, and the corner of that iPad hit her nose right here and opened it up like a pencil. I could see the bridge of her nose. It hurt me. The blood almost sickened me. And I would rather it had happened to me and been my hole in my head and, and, and my problem and my pain. Could you imagine Mary looking at her son nailed to a tree after she had maybe witnessed him being whipped beyond recognition because the Bible said you couldn't even tell that he was a man anymore. How did she feel? The pain. Why? This was one of the worst ways to be killed, the crucifixion. The Romans had thought of, of some of the most horrific and terrible ways to kill people. And this being their number one. Not only that, it was a shameful experience. And it was a disgraceful experience. I mean, you you heard the story that I just read. They had taken all of his clothing and they were gambling for it. So he's on this cross. He's unrecognizable. He's naked. It's a disgraceful thing for him. It's a shameful thing. It's a painful thing. And his mother is having to witness this entire thing but yet she's still there. See, Mary stands by her son through all of this experience. And see, what's amazing is mothers have the ability that no matter what, what your child may have done or what they're going through to be able to stand by their side. Listen, I understand there's times where your children may have disappointed you. They may have let you down. Maybe maybe they left the home on bad terms or whatever. But there's a part inside of you that still wants to be there, isn't there? There's a part inside of you that still loves them. And, and, and my hat goes off to parents that can still love their children and be there for them through some of the darkest times. I have a good friend that's going to be going to court this week, and it's a terrible case against him. And I, I don't even want to go into the details of the case, but his mom and his dad are going to be in that courtroom. And what they're going through right now up to that day and what may happen on that day, I I don't even want to know the pain that they're going through. The pain of a mother sitting at the hospital bed of her child. The the pain that she may go through when her kids say, I don't love you anymore, I want nothing to do with you, and they walk out the door. Those kinds of pains. Mary's experiencing 
very heavy pain here. I want to say this. Moms, don't give up hope on your children. <laughs> but for the grace of God, so, so go all of us. Right? And you know, I like the statement that I heard a long time ago, that God can save from the uttermost to the guttermost. I don't care where your kid may go. They don't go so far that God is not there and that God cannot reach them. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this right now, that a mother's prayer sometimes is the thing that God uses as the, the strength and the force behind that, reaching down and turning that person back. Listen, mothers have this ability to just love their kids. And you may have even said out of your own mouth that I don't love you anymore to your kid. But you know what? You didn't mean it. I know you didn't mean it. Because inside of every mother is a love that is just unconditional to the core. Mary was expressing this. Don't give up hope, moms. Many of the moms that I have seen and I have known through the ministry could have given up on their children. My mom could have given up on me, but thank God she didn't. And thank God these moms have it. I had a good friend at the church that I was with who all three of her children decided I don't believe in God anymore and walked away. I promise you she still prays every day that God somehow will reach her children. She prayed for 20-some years that her husband would get saved, and it did happen, Uncle Steve, so at least she has that bit to hang on to. But I tell you what, when I see her, I see the pain in her heart, but I do know this, that she's hoping And she's counting on God to somehow do something, some way, to bring that child back. Listen, the the different mothers this morning, if it'll help you, is you have that protective mother like Moses' mom. And you know what I'm talking about, right? You got that supportive part of you like Hannah, where you want to see your children be all they can be. And all they could ever be is what God would want them to be if you want them to be the most successful. Then you see the parent like Eunice, who taught Timothy And Grandma, Lois, was a part of this, taught Timothy and the responsibility we have to teach our children that falls to us. What a great responsibility and an awesome responsibility. And then we see that part of Mary, that loyal, that loyalty. To stand beside her son and love him, even when the world said he was a horrible, terrible person, even when he was disgraced and shamed, to stand by him and be there through his darkest hour. Listen, that's what moms do. That's in some way why moms are so amazing. Listen, if your mother is still alive today, honor her, love her, shower her with praises. And the Bible says that her children will rise up and call her blessed. Listen, I I thought about this before, even when I was thinking, my mom's unreasonable, my mom's over the top, why is she in my face all the time in my business, trying to keep me from having fun? Because she loved me, that's why. Because she didn't want me to go down a wrong path. Because she cared about me. Listen, and I thought to myself at a point where I really thought about rebelling against my parents, If all my mom did for me was give me life, she already did a lot for me. She had already gone a long way for me. If you read the Bible and understand what a woman goes through during childbirth, it talks about they go through the jaws of death literally to give birth to us. For a woman to sacrifice her body and for us to feed off of her and, and, and change her forever to give us life, for us not to honor her, shame on us for that. Listen, in conclusion, I think what we can be today is thankful to God for our mothers. We can be thankful to our mothers for what they've done for us. There are two challenges I have for you today. If you're estranged from your mom and she's still alive, go to her. If you need to forgive her in your heart for what she did to you, forgive her. Because I promise you her greatest pain is the fact that her children don't love her that her children want nothing to do with her. If you don't have a mother, find some lady who doesn't have children and make her important in your life. I think that would be a good thing. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've never given your heart to him. There's no greater joy for a mother to find out 
that our child has finally surrendered and given their life to Christ. The greatest gift you can give mom on Mother's Day is to give Jesus your heart today. I'll promise you that. Regardless of whether you're backslidden and you come back to him or whether you've never come to him at all, that would be the greatest joy she could experience today. If you got a mom, call her today. Let her know you love her. I'm going to pray, and when I'm done praying, I'm going to turn this over to Uncle Steve. Whatever you need to do in your heart, whatever God taught you today, I hope you take it with you and use it. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the examples in Scripture of these wonderful ladies and how they, they were just what they needed to be for their kids. Why? Because they just had that mother instinct. They, I believe they were godly people. I think of Moses' mom, what a godly lady. I think of Samuel's mom, what a godly lady. I think of Timothy's mom and grandma, godly ladies. Jesus' mother, an exceptional lady, godly lady. Lord, help our moms to be godly people. That'll be the example. That'll take the responsibility seriously. It's not a joking matter to be a parent. It breaks my heart, God, to look at moms that don't love their children and, and aren't there for their children and, 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 and some horrible things happen to children and it just bothers me because I know that was never your plan for a mother. Lord, I pray for those of us, whatever our influence might be to the kids around us that maybe don't have mothers that we would reach out to them. Lord, help moms to be that example, to be that instructive force to be the ones that keep praying for their kids no matter what. Not giving up hope because there's never, hope is never given up completely as long as we're still here. And as long as you're still on the throne. And Lord, there's a lot of things going on in our country. There's a lot of things going on in the world. And you know what? I have hope today because you're still on the throne. And we thank you for it. Thank you for our mothers. In Jesus' name, amen.